Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm gonna play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. Here we go. Hello, I'm Assistant Chief Ruben Ramirez of the Dallas Police Department's Criminal Investigations Bureau. I'm here to brief you on the details as we know them on the officer-involved shooting that occurred on July 25th, 2022 at 8008 Herb Kelleher Way, Dallas Love Field Airport. This is the third officer-involved shooting involving a Dallas police officer in 2022. Body-worn camera video will be shown at the end of this presentation. On July 25th, 2022, at 10.57 a.m., Portia Adufoa, 37, arrived at Dallas Love Field Airport and exited a red Kia sedan. The preliminary investigation shows Adufoa entered the terminal and walked into the restrooms. At 11.04 a.m., the suspect leaves the restrooms wearing a black hoodie with the hood over her head and her hands in the front pockets. The suspect walks from the bathroom to the Southwest Airlines ticket area and says she has an announcement to make. Witnesses say Adufoa starts to ramble, talking about marriage, incarceration, and then said she was going to blow up the airport and pulls a gun from her sweatshirt. At 11.06.44, she pointed the gun towards the ceiling and fired two rounds. Officer Ronald Cronin, a 15-year veteran of the Dallas Police Department, was in the immediate area and engaged Adufuwa, giving her verbal commands to drop the weapon. At 11.06.50 a.m., Adufuwa pointed her gun at Officer Cronin and an innocent bystander. At 11.06.51, Officer Cronin, taking cover behind a ticket kiosk, fired his department-issued weapon, hitting the suspect multiple times. The shots fired caused the suspect to fall to the ground and drop the weapon. Officer Cronin held his position and other DPD officers arrived to take a Dufoua into custody. Officers started first aid and called Dallas Fire Rescue for assistance. A Dufoua was transported to a local hospital for treatment. While processing the scene, law enforcement found rounds from Adufuwa's weapon showing she shot at Officer Cronin. She has been charged with aggravated assault against a public servant. Additional charges are possible. The Dallas Police Department's Special Investigations Unit responded and continues to investigate the incident. The Dallas County District Attorney's Office responded and is conducting an independent investigation as well. The Dallas police were assisted at the scene by the FBI and the ATF. In an effort to be transparent, the Dallas Police Department is releasing the body-worn camera footage of the incident. So, um, if you've never been in an airport before, um, where they're at, you don't have to go through a security checkpoint. Um, the security checkpoint is past this area. This is where people are coming in fresh off the street, and they're going to these little kiosks, and they're checking in. Like, yeah, I'm such and such. I'm uh, here for my flight from wherever to, you know, wherever. Um they get their boarding pass, you know, printed out or whatever, um, or if they got it on their phone, whatever, you know, the system will let the airline know that, you know, this person's here, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And then um, they'll go past this point, you know, they may go up to a booth or something like that. You can kind of see up here a little bit. They'll have their luggage weighed, and then they'll, they'll walk a little bit, and they'll get to the area where they have to go through the checkpoint. And that's where all the, the pat downs and all the x-rays and all that shit happens at. And then they go into the uh, boarding area and then they wait. Uh, so the boarding area is a secured area in a sense. Um, 
mostly speaking, you know, you get into the boarding area, there's a pretty damn good chance that the only people in that area with a gun are going to be the police uh, within that area. Out here, anybody could have anything. Just because you're in the grounds of an airport doesn't mean that you've been checked by people or whatever. So all these people right here, none of them have been checked at this point. Now, you know, they said that um, she asked for everyone's attention and then started talking about marriage and, and other shit. You see him walking up towards her. Uh, obviously, you know, he knows something's a little off. There's something a little weird going on with this person going back and forth, doing this rant. Uh, for other people who were there who could be, you know, in earshot or whatever, you know, when someone is exhibiting these signs and these behaviors, that's not the time to stand there and say, well, let's see what the fuck else unfolds. Um, but I think probably, you know, there's so many of these people that were probably just not in that mindset. They are probably thinking, oh, I'm in an airport. You know, nothing's going to happen in an airport. You know, hasn't shit happened since 2001. You know, but I'm safe in an airport. Uh, no, you're not. Not. Not at all. And this is a perfect illustration of um, how you're not safe even in a place that, you know, is supposed to be safe. So if you're in an area, even if it's a gun-free zone, you know, uh, you know, this is a gun-free zone. You're not supposed to be bringing guns into the airport. So um, this should be a, an indication to you when someone is acting weird like that. And they say, hey, I need everyone's attention. And they start rambling about stupid shit. That's your sign to get the fuck out of there. Like, who, I, I don't care what they got to talk about. That's not normal. At all. Now, sometimes people go on these rants or whatever, and they do stupid shit, and nothing ever happens. Yeah, that happens a lot. But you don't know what's going to happen. You don't have a, a little psychic ability. You don't have a little, little glass ball to you know figure out what the hell's going to be going on. If you did, you, you sure shit wouldn't be hanging around in a fucking airport somewhere. Uh, flying, you know, commercial, you have your own fucking private jet, right? <laughs> um, so when people, when, when people start doing shit like this, that's the sign for you to put as much distance between you and them as possible. Start moving away from that, from that odd occurrence. Get to a safer distance or location uh, from that person because you don't know when things are going to snap and then go kinetic now this is the point where it's snapping and going kinetic so i'll back it up a little bit and uh you'll see the officer making the approach and then her pulling the gun out So you can tell that he was giving directions to this person to get up and move. He can go forward. Looks like he's trying to get other people to go. So fight, fight, or free syndrome, uh, these people are kind of freezing at this point. Um, you know, they could very easily beat feet and get the fuck out of there, put as much distance between them and what's going on as possible. And ideally, that's what you should do. Uh, you should get up and move. Get the hell out of there. Because if this fight continues and bullets start flying, you don't know if you're going to be hit by a straight round or not. Even if you don't feel comfortable getting up and running, you can still low crawl out of there.
Now, take notice. He's shooting. There's a person right there. I'll get to that. I'll get to this here in a second. So we talk about firearms training. Um, traditional firearms training is where people stand on the shooting line, and the shooting line is a is a good straight line, and forward of them are targets, and everybody stands on the shooting line, shoulder to shoulder. Typically, people do not go forward of this line or backward of this line. You all would be standing. On the line. If anybody steps off the line, going forward or backwards, usually a range safety officer will blow the little whistle and uh, call for a ceasefire. In the beginning, when you are learning the fundamentals, that can be okay. However, at some point, your firearms training has to progress beyond just learning the fundamentals of working the gun. Uh, you have to start throwing in skills and, and tactics in there as well uh, that are beyond just the basic running the gun. You have to have people forward of the shooting line. You have to have people rear of the shooting line. You have to start creating that uh, range in a um, 360 like environment. So shooting ranges are all about the 180 rule. You, know, you can't break the 180 rule can't have anybody forward, you know, it's, it's unsafe, it's unsafe, it's unsafe. Well, that's unrealistic because we operate in a 360-degree world, not a 180-degree world. So in the beginning, yes, you need that 180 until you get people up to a certain level. And then once you get them up to a certain level, you can start having people go forward of the line and having them closer to the shooter. to make it as close to 360 as you can. And then past that point is when you start getting into um, marking cartridges using uh, the simunition guns. There is learning potential when you are on the range and someone is five, six feet behind you and they're shooting past you or vice versa. There are some people who will who will lose their fucking mind over this and say that's unsafe, um, that's crazy talk, uh, don't do that, blah blah blah. Um, but these are people who who've never gone past the 180 part in firearms training, and they have a very unrealistic view on things and don't completely understand that 360 environment. So. Um, a good firearms training course, uh, once you learn the basics of how to, how to fight with the gun, uh, then you have to start incorporating your movements while working that gun, going and using cover and, and working around people and, and whatnot. Um, and then, like I said, that's going, graduating into the force on force stuff um, to fully um, integrate everything that you've learned and to validate everything that you learned, and then to learn on top of that. So this is a, an illustration of why it's important that you have to break that 180 range bullshit, because there are going to be people who are going to be forward, to, forward of you while you're shooting, and there are going to be people behind you to the side of you while you're shooting. Now, he is attempting to utilize cover, uh, to what extent these little kiosks are going to provide cover, I don't really know. Uh, I don't know what's inside these things. Um, there could be a lot of computer guts and stuff in it that could deflect around enough to slow it down and, and protect them, or it could just be like a damn car door and go right straight through it. Um, so is this really true cover? Um, probably not. Probably not at all. It's probably... Probably like a car, like you probably send around right through the fucking thing and it's not going to stop anything. Okay, now I'll back 
this up some. So, boom, boom, monitor comes in, pop, pop, it pop. He shoots her, and then you see that the gun land right here. Now, we'll play it forward. Now, I don't know if he's giving her verbal commands or not. He's talking on the radio at this point. He's looking around, seeing who's here. He's telling that one woman to get up and move. He's going forward. He's telling the people to move. And she's inching closer towards that gun. He's talking on his radio. And then now she's getting close to it. He's telling people to get out of the way. Boom, she puts her hand on it. So I don't know, at this point, I don't know if he is giving her verbal commands to push that thing out of the way or not. Um, if he is, then I don't think he needs to be telling her to, to put her hand near it. Um, I think that the best course of action would be to get her to move away from it. She is obviously um, able of moving under her own power she was out of camera view and then came into camera view and went towards the gun so she's perfectly capable of moving um i don't think that telling her to grab the gun and push it out of the way is the best thing to do because all she has to do is grab it and then start shooting and sometimes uh action beats reaction uh you know she could have got a couple rounds off before he dumped more into her um and that you know it could be really bad um if she got lucky and got a lucky hit, lucky hit him. If he had no verbal instructions to her whatsoever, if he was not telling her to reach for that gun and move out of the way, then he has failed to act properly. Now, I have not seen all of this footage. I don't know if we're going to go into camera, body camera view or not. Um, but if she's doing this and she's reaching out and she's driving this gun and he has not given her any instructions to do that, and he has not fired, that's wrong on him. He has failed in his mission. Um, anybody that reaches for a fucking gun after shooting it, and you happen to shoot them, if they reach for that damn gun again, that's green light. That is fucking green light right there. Give them seconds. See backup coming in. <clears throat> All right. So he had a, um, a bottle in his hand, and he retreated back here, and he dropped that thing out of his hand. That's good. Uh, there's so many videos that I've seen where people have something in their uh, hand, and a lot of times it ends up being their non-dominant hand. They'll have something in their hand, and then when they try to go pull their gun and, and put their hands together to get a two-handed grip, they still got that thing in their hand. Usually it's a radio. Uh, especially from the NYPD and LAPD videos. It's usually radio in their hand. And they're trying to get a two-handed grip. Or a lot of times, if it's nighttime, you'll see them holding a flashlight in one hand, and then they try to slap both hands together. Uh, I've seen people do it with keys. So that's a common thing to do. Um, I think that good firearms training uh, should also include drills where you have things in your hand that you need to jettison and get the fuck rid of because it's not going to help you in a gunfight. So... This could be in the form of, um, you know, if you're working in the law enforcement or, or security capacity, this could be in the form of retaining your broken flashlights. Uh, you know, you got a flashlight that breaks. Don't throw it away. Keep it. Paint a blue stripe down it. Wrap some blue tape around it. Whatever. Throw it in the training bucket. Use it as a training prop. Same thing with tasers. Uh, if you get a taser, it's fucking broke. It's an older model. Axon's not going to service it or anything like that. Keep it. Paint it blue, wrap some blue tape around it, whatever, turn it into a training unit. That way you can practice dropping these things on the ground. 
or you can go pay the 50 to 100 plus dollars for the blue gun props. You know, you get the blue rubber radio and the blue flashlight and the blue taser um, and use those uh, for, for training. But if you got equipment that breaks, it's still usable. You still use it as a training prop. Don't throw that thing away. Put some blue tape on it or uh, paint it blue and throw it into the training rotation. So um, I definitely think stuff like that needs to be incorporated into uh, shooting drills where you practice to jettison things out of your hand that you don't need during a gunfight. So I like how he just drops the bottle and, and gets to it. We see that he fires a few rounds. I uh, don't know exactly how many rounds he ends up firing. But we see that it's a few. Now, we see him reaching up to a microphone on his chest. And if you've ever watched any of my other videos, uh, particularly ones that come out of uh, Los Angeles or New York, a lot of times uh, you will see these officers holding their radio in their hand. And that's usually where I go into a gripe or a rant about why that's stupid and they should do away with that practice and put a lapel mic on. And this is a, a great illustration of why, um, or this is a great supporting illustration in, in those rants that I go on. So this officer is able to, because he has a lapel mic on his radio, he's able to reach up with one hand, press a button, talk, let go, and put his hand back on the gun. Those are less movements, and those movements take a lot less time. If he had a portable radio that he had to take out of his belt, off his belt, talk into it, and then put it back, that's more movements, and that's more downtime of him not being able to have his gun or his hand on his gun. And, and if something were to happen right then and there while he's got that radio in his hand, he's either going to have to A, drop it right then and there and go to a two-handed grip or start shooting one-handed um, while retaining whatever, you know, the radio in his hand. So this is why lapel mics are a much-needed thing in public safety, especially when it comes to law enforcement and security. Uh, you know, if you're going to be needing to operate uh, a defense tool, if you're needing a fight, you need both hands in the fight. You don't need one hand holding a damn radio and putting yourself at risk of dropping that radio and becoming separated from that radio. That radio is, for law enforcement, that radio is your lifeline. That's how you call the, the rest of the cavalry to get there. If you drop that damn thing, you get separated from it, you can't get the rest of the cavalry to come to you. You can't relay critical information to people. So lapel mics are a much needed thing. That. <laughs> like, like that, that shit, shit right, right there. there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Great fucking shit right here. Boom. He drops his fucking radio. Why? Because he's not using a lapel mic. <laughs> this video is a fucking gold mine. Yeah, so this is exactly what I'm talking about with radios um, that don't have a lapel mic on them. You have to reach down to your belt, pull it out of its pouch, un undo the swivel hook, or whatever, and get it out. Well, this dude, he fumbled it. He dropped the damn radio. What if the gunfight popped off right then and there and he was by himself and he had to move to a better form of cover? Well, he's not going to get that radio in down and put it back. He's going to have to put rounds down range and get off the X. So another great illustration why you need a lapel mic. Now, his choice of cover, 
<laughs> is it a trash can? Um, that's not covered at that point. The kiosks, although I don't think they're good forms of cover, cover either, um, at least they have, you know, electric, electrical components, circuit boards, and, you know, um, like a little mini rack thing in there, so to speak. Um, more material on the inside. This trash can, it's, it's, no, it's just super, super, super thin fucking metal. Again, the housing on this kiosk is, is thin too. Um, but at least, you know, if this thing's got a printer in it and everything, there's more stuff. There's more hard stuff on the inside to help deflect around. This, it's just thin ass fucking metal and a bag with like paper in it. Like this shit is not stopping bullets at all. So I would have much more have rather seen him go get behind this kiosk over here than to get in behind this little rinky-dink trash can. Might as well be hiding behind someone's luggage at this point. Stay out. So he has uh, activated his body camera at this point. Um, now the last, let's say it has 30 seconds of um, pre-event buffer on it. Uh, the last 30 seconds is probably just going to be him in the same position right here. That's all you were going to see if they included that pre-event buffer footage in there. So I don't think we're losing much um, by them not including that. Um, we see a bullet hole right here. Um, not sure where that bullet hole came from. I think it probably came from him when he started shooting at her. Um, but it also could be around coming from her towards him. But I kind of, based off the way it looks, I think it's probably one of his rounds. That shooter, yeah, stay there. Sierra 301. Like the F-bomb that went down. Show us your hands. <laughs> Put your hands out where we can see. Stay there, folks. Stay right there. Stay right there. Don't move. Can't see nothing. Back up. Hey, back, back up. Back up. Back up. Come we got here. it. Come we, here. And we hold. We hold. Hold, hold what we got. Hold what we got. Don't move. Stay there. Get back. Get back. Got DFR coming. Okay, we're just gonna. Okay. So, who do you want to go? Hold on. All right. Stay there, what are you doing? Hey. Give me two. Give me two, give me two, give me two. Hey, we got gloves, we got gloves. Last fire. Watch the last fire, watch the last fire. Hey, you guys get it? Stay back. Stay back. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. So they're taking her into custody, and um, <clears throat> this person in the back over here is, is engaging the rest of the crowd and asking if anybody's hurt. Um, so in a very you know populated area like this, you know that's a that's a good thing to do because rounds get missed during gunfights. Rounds can uh, ricochet. Rounds can hit metal and actually come back towards where it originated from. Plenty of people have been at the shooting range and shot a steel target and the fucking round came back and hit them. <laughs> fucking happens. Um, so either, you know, a straight round could have hit someone or a round could have ricocheted and hit someone or could have come back and hit someone. Rounds could have hit something and splintered um, and fragments of that round could have hit people um, and they'd be injured that way. So it's always good in a you know, urban populated area to, to check around and ask people if they're okay and, and go look and check and make sure people are okay, especially if there's a bunch of people laying down. Um, go over there and, and, and visually check each person because just because a person's laying down, uh, they haven't said anything doesn't mean they're not hurt. They could be unconscious and they could be bleeding um, or they could, you know, have something wrong with them. 
um, they'd be, you know, experiencing a medical problem and you need to be able to give them medical aid. So he's doing a good thing by going around checking on the people, making sure they're all right. Uh, they're cuffing her, even though she's been shot. That's a that's a standard thing, pretty much all across the nation. Uh, pretty much, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the rest of the world. Um, because sometimes people get back up after they've been shot, and sometimes they become violent again. You know, she went down. She appeared to be incapacitated, was no longer willing to fight anymore. But that doesn't mean that she can't regain that confidence. She can't regain that fighting spirit and start fighting some more. And when you handcuff someone, handcuff their hands behind their back, it's a lot harder for them to fight you uh, when they're cuffed up like that. So standard thing to cuff someone after they've been cuffed or shot. Now you also notice the wall in the background here. These look like bullet strikes. So he fired multiple rounds, but I don't know how many rounds he fired, but we can see two hits on the wall here, so that's two misses. And that's that's common within gunfights. There are missed rounds in a gunfight. I'm not saying it's 100% acceptable or, you know, saying, hey, you know, it's fine. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just pointing out the fact that there are misses in gunfights. And that's, again, that's another reason why firearms training needs to be taken a little bit more um serious um and there needs to be more into it versus just the bare minimum kind of stuff If I put that on there, quick, say it's clear. Let him in. 16, suspect in custody. Bring him in. You guys okay? So it looks like... <coughs> Excuse me. It looks like potentially there are four rounds that have missed. It looks like two he planted in the kiosk and two are on the wall over here. You got a, is that who's here or do you have a? Uh, yeah, they were, they were, they were coming like we from have, behind. We got a wound right here on the side. All right, come, come in. We need to get this before they get here. Does anybody have a bag? Okay, we got one shooter in the middle wing. Everything else is uh, uh, you have on anything else. It's not, you're, you're I don't have any good. Just tell me what yeah, to do. Here, just in case they need, put, start putting these on. Are you with me? Can you hear me? All right, got evidence coming, okay? What is your name? We need that box up here. Is anybody up here? The box is raining. Can we get the box up here? Bring him in. Bring him in. He's low. No way, doctor. Is anyone over here? Bring him in. Somebody in that squad car, bring her in. Bring him in. Where they at, sir? Um, and that's that's it. So I'm going to back up. Let's see if I can see the back side of the kiosk. Okay. 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 Okay.
give me two, give me two, give me two. We're going to pull. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so like I said, I think those are his rounds um, as he was coming this way and he was shooting, I'd say two in the there, um, and there was a person right fucking below him, right below uh, where those rounds hit, so this is why uh, when it comes to firearms training, you got to do more than just your standard 180 stuff, learning just the basics, like once you get those basics down, then you need to start moving um, on the range, having people taking cover and people shooting around that cover with those people around in front of it, behind it, whatever. Uh, and then incorporating some of that stuff into your force on force as well. Um, a good, a good pistol training, um, a good training course for pistols, uh, to, to start from learning the, the very bare bone basics to going into that advanced kind of stuff right there uh, should realistically be um, almost, you know, four to five days worth of pistol stuff and shooting, you know, a few thousand rounds. Uh, that's ideally some of the stuff that needs to go into um, what needs to be involved in, in having a good... Um, pistol class or good um, foundation for uh, learning to fight with a pistol. Um, only firing but a few hundred rounds and spending a day on pistol is, is not enough. It, it's really not. Um, in fact, I'd say that's, that's, that's just borderline fucking negligent. Um, you should spend no less than fucking two days learning how to fight with a pistol. No less than two days. If it's just one day, um, then something's seriously wrong there. Um, and that, and that's also why, you know, I say that concealed carry classes are 
not real gun classes. Uh, a concealed carry class is basically nothing more than a safety class. Uh, it's really all it is. It's just a watered down safety class. Uh, there is no fucking gun fighting learning to be had in a concealed carry class. <clears throat> Um, so they got her down and started to uh, administer, well, they wasn't so much administering aid to her, but they were recognizing the need to go ahead and start administering aid. So uh, she even asked uh, something like, do you have a bag? And I'm assuming she meant like a trauma bag or something like that. So um, obviously uh, they should be carrying medical gear on them. I'm a firm believer that if you're going to carry the tools to induce trauma, you should have the tools to reduce trauma. If you carry a gun on a daily basis, whether you do it as an armed citizen or you do it because of your profession in law enforcement or security, um, you carry a gun on a daily basis, then you should be able to recognize the fact that you could be involved in the gunfight. And if you potentially you're going to be involved in the gunfight, that means you should recognize that the bullets go both ways and you could be shot or someone on your teammate or someone on your team could be shot or a family member could be shot. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, law enforcement and, uh, well, actually not just law enforcement, but uh, also security and armed citizen, uh, when you carry that medical gear, that medical gear is meant to be for you and or your teammate or family. That's what that medical gear is for. Can it be used on other people? Yes, it can be. But reluctantly, it needs to be used on other people. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I don't mean like neglect the person and don't provide care to them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying be smart about how you use your limited medical equipment. You don't want to put your only tourniquet on the bad guy and the scene is not 100% secure. And then some other crazy fuck comes out and starts shooting. If you only have one tourniquet, and you put that tourniquet on the bad guy, and the scene is not 100% secure, and then you or a teammate gets shot, and you get hit in the femoral artery, what are you going to do? You going to take that tourniquet off that bad guy and put it on you? Probably not. So... That's what I mean by reluctantly using it. Uh, the only time that you should be using your medical gear, the stuff you carry on other people, is if the scene is 110% secure. And by 110% secure, you have no less than a fucking platoon of police officers on scene. And between that damn near platoon size <laughs> fucking number of officers there, there's probably at least going to be one to two more tourniquets. So if something does pop off, one, you got superior, uh, superior fucking firepower to suppress the threat, and it's more likely there's going to be more medical gear on hand to be able to treat any injuries on uh, the good guys if something were to happen. If it's not 110, if it's not 110 percent secure, don't waste your medical gear because you don't know if some other crazy fuck's going to pop around the corner and continue this fight. Now, aside from that, um, the only way I the only way I would deviate from that is if it happens to involve like a little kid, like a, a random ass innocent kid. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to be more likely to, while the scene's not 110 percent safe, use my tourniquet on a little kid. Um, when it comes to adults, no, like you had the same opportunities as me, man. Like you had. You had a connection to the internet. You were able to watch fucking YouTube. You could have learned about this shit. Uh, but you, you you failed to do so. So that's on you. Little kids, they ain't get those same opportunities. Um, I mean, they might have access to YouTube, but I mean, they're not going to go out and get jobs and be able to afford shit like buying tourniquets or going to CPR first aid classes or EMT trauma classes or anything like that. So... Little kids, they don't have the same opportunities, and they're little kids, so I'll, I'll deviate for kids. But adults, sorry, man, you have the same fucking, same opportunities as me. Uh, you're the one who neglected to better yourself and educate yourself on how to save your life, or you're the, you neglected to go buy those things to help save your own life. Before they get here? Does anybody have a bag? 
Okay, and we got one shooter uh, in a in the wing. Everything else is uh, 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 you have gloves on. Check anything out. Um, she does mention that she has a, a round in the leg. Uh, at this point, she could go ahead and start pulling her pants down to expose that wound to see exactly where it's at, get an idea of how much blood's coming out, apply pressure to it if need be, um, until they can get, you know, if there's enough blood coming out to justify the need for a tourniquet. If not, just apply pressure to it and uh, wait for follow-on medical gear. Not, Not much, much else to say about this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.